Book 12. So within the shelter the warlike son of Menoetios tended stricken Eurypylos, and meanwhile the Argives and Trojans fought on in mass battle, nor was the Danaan ditch going to hold them back nor the wide wall above it they had built for the sake of their ships, and driven a deep ditch about it, and had not given to the gods grand sacrifices so that it might guard their running ships and their masses of spoil within it. It had been built in despite of the immortal gods, and therefore it was not to stand firm for a long time. So long as Hector was still alive, and Achilles was angry, so long as the citadel of Lord Priam was a city untaken, for this time the great wall of the Achaeans stood firm. But afterward when all the bravest among the Trojans had died in the fighting, and many of the Argives had been beaten down, and some left, when in the tenth year the city of Priam was taken and the Argives gone in their ships to the beloved land of their fathers, then at last Poseidon and Apollo took counsel to wreck the wall, letting loose the strength of rivers upon it, all the rivers that run to the sea from the mountains of Ida, Rhesos and Heptaporos, Caresos and Rhodios, Grenicos and Isipos, and immortal Scamandros, and Simoes, where much oxhide armor and helmets were tumbled in the river mud, and many of the race of the half-god mortals. Phoebos Apollo turned the mouths of these waters together and nine days long threw the flood against the wall, and Zeus reigned incessantly, to break the wall faster and wash it seaward. And the shaker of the earth himself holding in his hands the trident guided them, and hurled into the waves all the bastions strengthening of logs and stones the toiling Achaeans had set in position and made all smooth again by the hard-running passage of Hele and once again piled the great beach under sand, having wrecked the wall, and turned the rivers again to make their way down the same channel where before they had run the bright stream of their water. Thus, afterward, Poseidon and Apollo were minded to put things in place, but at this time battle and clamour were blazing about the strong-founded wall and the bastion timbers were thundering as they were struck, as the Argives broken under Zeus lashing were crowded back on their hollow ships, and struggled to get clear in dread of Hector, the strong one who drove men to thoughts of panic. But Hector, as he had before, fought on like a whirlwind. As when among a pack of hounds and huntsmen assembled a wild boar or lion turns at bay in the strength of his fury, and the men, closing themselves into a wall about him, stand up to face him, and cast at him with the volleying spears thrown from their hands, and in spite of this the proud heart feels not terror, nor turns to run, and it is his own courage that kills him, and again and again he turns on them trying to break the massed men and wherever he charges the masses of men break away in front of him, such was Hector as he went through the battle and rallied his companions and drove them on to cross over the ditch, but now the fast-footed horses balked at the edge of the lip, and dared not cross, whinnying loud, since the ditch in its great width frightened them from it, being not easy for them to overleap, nor to walk through, since along the whole length the jut of the overhang stood on both sides, and the surface of the floor was thick-set with pointed palisades, which the sons of the Achaeans had paled their dents and huge, so as to hold off the rage of attackers and a horse straining at the strong-wheeled chariot might not easily enter there, but the dismounted were strong in their effort. And now Polydama stood beside bold Hector, and spoke to him, Hector, and other lords of the Trojans and companions in battle, we are senseless trying to drive our fast-footed horses over this ditch. It is hard indeed to cross, and sharp stakes are planted inside it, and across from these the wall of the Achaeans. There, there is no way to get down, no way again to do battle from horses, for the passage is narrow and I think they must be hurt there. For now if Zeus who thunders on high and evil intention toward these is destroying them utterly, sending aid to the Trojans, this is the way I would wish it, may it happen immediately that the Achaeans be destroyed here forgotten and far from Argos, but if they turn again and a backrush comes on us out of the ships, and we are driven against the deep ditch, then I think no longer could one man to carry a message get clear to the city, once the Achaeans have turned back upon us. Come then, do as I say, let us all be persuaded, let us tell our henchmen to check our horses here by the ditch, then let ourselves, all of us dismounted and armed in our war gear, follow Hector in mass formation. As for the Achaeans, they will not hold, if the bonds of death are fastened upon them. So spoke Polydamas, and this counsel of safety pleased Hector and at once in all his armour he leapt to the ground from his chariot, and the rest of the Trojans assembled, not mounted behind their horses, but all sprang to the ground, when they saw brilliant Hector had done it. Then each man gave orders to his own charioteer to check the horses in good order at the edge of the ditch, and the fighters formed apart into groups, then closing together into five well-ordered battalions followed their leaders. They who went with Hector and Polydamas the blameless, these were most numerous, and bravest, and beyond others furious to smash the wall and fight their way among the hollow ships, and Kebriones went with them as third man, while by the chariots Hector had left another man, not so good as Kebriones. 
Paris led the next group with Alcathus and Agenor, and Helenus, with godlike Daphobos, led the third group, sons both of Priam, and Aetios was with them as third man, Aetios, son of Herticos, whom his tall shining horses had carried over from Arisbe and beside the river Celeus. The leader of the fourth group was the strong son of Anchises, Aeneas, and with him were the two sons of Antinor, Archilochos and Akamas, both skilled in all fighting. Sarpedon led the far-renowned companions in battle, and had chosen to go with him Glaucos and warlike Asteropios since these seemed to him to be marked out as the bravest of the rest, after himself, but among all he was preeminent. Now when these had closed their wrought ox-hide shields together they charged straight for the Danans, eagerly, with no thought longer of being held, but rather to hurl themselves on the black ships. Then the rest of the Trojans and renowned companions in battle were willing to follow the order of blameless Puladamas. Only Aetios, Hertico's son, lord of men, was unwilling to leave his horses there and a charioteer to attend them but kept them with him, and so drove on at the fast-running vessels, poor fool, who by the ships in the pride of his horses and chariot was not destined to evade the evil spirits of destruction nor ever to make his way back again to Windy Ilion. Before this the dark-named destiny had shrouded about him through the spear of Idomeneus, proud son of Deucalion. For he sent his horses to the left of the ships, where the Achaeans were streaming back from the level ground with horses and chariots, and this way he drove his chariot and horses, and found there the leaves not yet pushed home in the gates, nor the long door bar, but men were holding them wide apart, on the chance of rescuing some one of their companions running for the ships from the battle. Of a purpose he steered his horses straight there, and his men followed screaming aloud, since they thought the Achaeans no longer would hold, but that they would be driven back on their dark ships. Fools! Since in the gates they found two men of the bravest, high-hearted sons of the spear-fighting Lapithai, one the son of Perithus, powerful Polypoites, and one Leontius, a man like the murderous god of battles. Now these two, who had taken their place in front of the high gates, stood there like two oaks who rear their crests in the mountains and through day upon day stand up to the wind and the rain beat since their great roots reach far and are gripped in the ground. So these two, in the confidence of their strength and their hands' work, stood up to tall Aetios advancing upon them, nor gave way. But these, holding up high the tanned leather of their shields, moved straight in on the strong-built wall with enormous clamour around Aetios their lord and Imenus and Orestes, and Aetios son Adamas, and Oinomaus and Thun. In this time the Lapithai still inside the wall were striving to stir up the strong-grieved Achaeans to defend the vessels, but among the Danans, when they saw the Trojans sweeping on against the wall, a clamour arose, and they gave way, and the two bursting through the gates fought on in front of them. They were in the likeness of two wild boars who in the mountains await a rabble of men and dogs advancing upon them and as they go tearing slantwise and rip the timber about them to pieces at the stock, the grinding scream of their teeth sounds high, until some man hits them with his throw and takes the lie from them, such was the grinding scream from the bright bronze covering their chest struck hard on by spears, for they fought a very strong battle in the confidence of their own strength. And the people above them. These flung about them with great stones torn from the strong-founded bastions, as they fought in defence of themselves, and the shelters, and the fast-running vessels, so that the flung stones dropped to the ground like snowflakes which the winds blast whirling the shadowy clouds drifts in their abundance along the prospering earth. So the missiles flung from the hands of Achaeans, and Trojans also, went showering, and the helms and shields massive in the middle crashed hollow underneath the impact of rocks like millstones. And now Aetios, Hertico's son, groaned aloud and beat on both thighs with his hands, and spoke aloud in his agony, Zeus' father, now even you are made utterly a lover of deception. For I never thought the fighting Achaeans would be able to hold our strength and our hands invincible. But they, as wasps quick bending in the middle, or as bees will make their homes at the side of the rocky way, and will not abandon the hollow house they have made, but stand up to men who come to destroy them, and fight for the sake of their children, so these, though they are only two, are unwilling to give back from the gates, until they have killed their men, or are taken. He spoke, but by such talk did not persuade the heart of Zeus whose desire it was to extend the glory to Hector. And now at the various gates various men fought each other. It were too much toil for me, as if I were a god, to tell all this, for all about the stone wall the inhuman strength of the fire was rising, and the Argives fought unhappily, yet they must fight on, to defend their ships. And all the gods who were helpers of the Danans in the fighting were dejected in spirit. But the Lapithai fought on and closed in the hateful fighting, and there the son of Perithus, powerful Polypoites, struck Damasos with the spear through the bronze-sided helmet, and the brazen helmet could not hold 
but the bronze spearhead driven on through smashed the bone apart, and the inward brain was all spattered forth. So he beat him down in his fury. Then he went on to kill Pylon and Orminos. Meanwhile Leontius, the scion of Ars, struck down Antimacho's son, Hippomachos, with a spear cast into the war belt and afterward drawing his sharp sword out of the scabbard made a rush through the crowding men, and struck from close up Antifates first, so that he crashed on his back to the ground, then beat down along the prospering Earthmenon and Orestes and Imenus, all beaten down in rapid succession. Now as these were stripping their men of the shining armor, the fighting men following with Puladamas and Hector, who were most numerous, and bravest, and beyond others furious to smash the wall, and set fire to the vessels, these still were divided in doubt as they stood there at the ditch's edge. As they were urgent to cross a bird sign had appeared to them, an eagle, flying high and holding to the left of the people and carrying in its talons a gigantic snake, blood-colored, alive still and breathing, it had not forgotten its warcraft yet, for writhing back it struck the eagle that held it by chest and neck, so that the eagle let it drop groundward in pain of the bite, and dashed it down in the midst of the battle and itself, screaming high, winged away down the wind's blast. And the Trojans shivered with fear as they looked on the lithe snake lying in their midst, a portent of Zeus of the Aegis. And now Polydama stood beside bold Hector and spoke to him, Hector, somehow in assembly you move ever against me though I speak excellently, since indeed there is no good reason for you, in your skill, to argue wrong, neither in the councils nor in the fighting, and ever to be upholding your own cause. Now once more I will speak out the way it seems best to me. Let us not go on and fight the Danans by their ships. I think it will end as the portent was accomplished, if the bird sign that came to the Trojans as we were trying to cross was a true one, an eagle, flying high and holding to the left of the people and carrying in its talons a gigantic snake, blood-colored, alive, but let it drop suddenly before winning his own home, and could not finish carrying it back to give to his children. So we, even though in our great strength we break in the gates and the wall of the Achaeans, and the Achaeans give way before us, we shall not take the same ways back from the ships in good order, since we shall leave many Trojans behind us, whom the Achaeans will cut down with the bronze as they fight for themselves by their vessels. So an interpreter of the gods would answer, one who knew in his mind the truth of portents, and whom the people believed in. Looking darkly at him tall Hector of the Shining Helm answered, Puladamas, these things that you argue please me no longer. Your mind knows how to contrive a saying better than this one. But if in all seriousness this is your true argument, then it is the very gods who ruined the brain within you, you who are telling me to forget the counsels of thunderous Zeus, in which he himself nodded his head to me and assented. But you, you tell me to put my trust in birds, who spread wide their wings. I care nothing for these, I think nothing of them, nor whether they go by on our right against dawn and sunrise or go by to the left against the glooming mist and the darkness. No, let us put our trust in the counsel of great Zeus, he who is lord over all mortal men and all the immortals. One bird sign is best, to fight in defense of our country. Why are you so afraid of war and hostility? Even though all the rest of us were to be cut down around you among the Argive ships, you would run no danger of dying since your heart is not enduring in battle nor a fighter's. But if you shrink away from the murderous work, or turn back some other man from the fighting, beguiling him with your arguments, at once beaten down under my spear you will lose your own life. He spoke, and led the way, and the rest of them came on after him with unearthly clamor, and over them Zeus who delights in the thunder drove down from among the hills of Ida the blast of a windstorm which swept the dust straight against the ships. He was mazing the minds of the Achaeans, and giving glory to the Trojans and Hector, and they in the confidence of the portents shown, and their own strength, worked to break down the great wall of the Achaeans. They tore at the projections on the outworks, and broke down the battlements and shook with levers the jut of the buttresses the Achaeans had stuck in the earth on the outer face to shore their defences. They tore at these, in hope of breaking down the Achaeans' wall, but now the Danans did not give way in front of them, but they, fencing the battlements with the hides of oxen, hurled from the wall at the enemy who came on beneath it. The two Aeantes, walking up and down the length of the ramparts, urged the men on, stirring up the warcraft of the Achaeans, and stung them along, using kind words to one, to another hard ones, whenever they saw a man hang back from the fighting, dear friends, you who are preeminent among the Argives, you who are of middle estate, you who are of low account, since all of us are not alike in battle, this is work for all now, and you yourselves can see it. Now let no man let himself be turned back upon the ships for the sound of their blustering but keep forever forward calling out courage to each other. So may Olympian Zeus who grips the thunderbolt grant us a way to the city, when we beat off the attack of our enemies. 
Such was their far cry, and they stirred the Achaeans' war strength. And they, as storms of snow descend to the ground incessant on a winter day, when Zeus of the councils, showing before men what shafts he possesses, brings on a snowstorm and stills the winds asleep in the solid drift, enshrouding the peaks that tower among the mountains and the shoulders outjutting, and the low lands with their grasses, and the prospering work of men's hands, and the drift falls along the grey sea, the harbours and beaches, and the surf that breaks against it is stilled, and all things elsewhere it shrouds from above, with the burden of Zeus' rain heavy upon it, so numerous and incessant were the stones volleyed from both sides, some thrown on Trojans, others flung against the Achaeans by Trojans, so the whole length of the wall thundered beneath them. And not even then might the Trojans and glorious Hector have broken in the gates of the rampart, and the long door bar, had not Zeus of the councils driven his own son, Sarpedon, upon the Argives, like a lion among horn-curved cattle. Presently he held before him the perfect circle of his shield, a lovely thing of beaten bronze, which the bronze smith hammered out for him, and on the inward side had stitched ox hides in close folds with golden staples clean round the circle. Holding this shield in front of him, and shaking two spears, he went onward like some hill-kept lion, who for a long time has gone lacking meat, and the proud heart is urgent upon him to get inside of a close steading and go for the sheep flocks. And even though he finds herdsmen in that place, who are watching about their sheep flocks, armed with spears, and with dogs, even so he has no thought of being driven from the steading without some attack made, and either makes his spring and seizes a sheep, or else himself is hit in the first attack by a spear from a swift hand thrown. So now his spirit drove on godlike Sarpedon to make a rush at the wall and break apart the battlements. And now he spoke in address to Glaucos, son of Hippolochos, Glaucos, why is it you and I are honoured before others with pride of place, the choice meats and the filled wine cups in Lycia, and all men look on us as if we were immortals, and we are appointed a great piece of land by the banks of Xanthos, good land, orchard and vineyard, and ploughland for the planting of wheat? Therefore it is our duty in the forefront of the Lycians to take our stand, and bear our part of the blazing of battle, so that a man of the close-armoured Lycians may say of us, Indeed, these are no ignoble men who are lords of Lycia, these kings of ours, who feed upon the fat sheep appointed and drink the exquisite sweet wine, since indeed there is strength of valour in them, since they fight in the forefront of the Lycians. Man, supposing you and I, escaping this battle, would be able to live on forever, ageless, immortal, so neither would I myself go on fighting in the foremost nor would I urge you into the fighting where men win glory. But now, seeing that the spirits of death stand close about us in their thousands, no man can turn aside nor escape them, let us go on and win glory for ourselves, or yield it to others. He spoke, nor did Glaucos disobey him nor turn aside from him. They, leading the great horde of the Lycians, advanced straight onward, and the son of Pteos, Menestheus, shivered as he saw them since they came against his bastion and carried disaster upon it. He scanned the rampart of the Achaeans in the hope of seeing some great chief who could beat back the bane from his company, and saw the two Aeantes, insatiate of battle, standing on the wall, and two crows even now coming up from the shelter, and close by, but he was not able to cry out and make them hear, so great was the clamour about him as the shouts hit skyward, as shields were battered with missiles, and the helmets crested with horse, hair, and the gates, which all had been slammed shut. And the Trojans standing against them were trying to break them down and force their way in. At once he sent Thoots off as a runner to Aias, go on the run, brilliant Thoots, and call Aias here, or better, both Aeantes, since that would be far the best thing that could happen, since here headlong destruction is building against us. Such is the weight of the Lycian lords upon us, who even before now have shown as deadly men in the strong encounters. But if in their place also hard work and fury have arisen, at least let powerful Telamonian Aias come by himself, and let Tucros follow with him, with his craft in the bow's use. He spoke, nor did the herald disobey when he heard him, but went on the run along the wall of the bronze-armoured Achaeans and came and stood by the two Aeantes, and spoke to them straight out, Aeantes, leaders of the bronze-armoured Argives, Menestheus, beloved son of Pteos engendered of Zeus, desires you to go where he is and meet the danger, if only for a little, both of you for choice, since that would be far the best thing that could happen, since their headlong destruction is building. Against him. Such is the weight of the Lycian lords upon him, who even before now have shown as deadly men in the strong encounters. But if in this place also hard fighting and fury have arisen, at least let powerful Telamonian Aias come by himself and let Tucros follow with him, with his craft in the bow's use. 
he spoke, and huge Telamonian and Aias did not disobey him, but at once called out in winged words to Aias, the son of Oileus, Aias, now you too, yourself and strong Lycomedes, must stand your ground and urge on the Danans to fight strongly. I am going over there to meet the attack, and afterward I will come back soon, when I have beaten them back from the others. So speaking Telamonian and Aias went away, and with him went Teucros, his brother by the same father, and following them was Pandion, who carried the curved bow for Teucros. They kept inside the wall as they went, till they came to the bastion of high-hearted Menestheus, and found men who were hard-pressed there, for the strong lords and men of council among the Lycians came on against the battlements like a darkening storm wind, and they charged forward to fight with these, and the clamour rose high. First to kill his man was Telamonian Aias. It was Sarpedon's companion in arms, high-hearted Epicles, whom he struck with a great jagged stone, that lay at the inside of the wall, huge, on top of the battlements. A man could not easily hold it, not even if he were very strong, in both hands, of men such as men are now, but he heaving it high through it, and smashed in the four-sheeted helm, and pounded to pieces the bones of the head inside it, so that Epicles dropped like a diver from the high bastion, and the life left his bones. And two crows with an arrow struck the strong son of Hippolochos, Glaucos, as he was swarming aloft the wall's high bastion, where he saw the arm was bare of defence, and stayed his warcraft, he sprang down from the wall, secretly, for fear some Achaean might see that he had been hit and vaunt with high words over him. Sarpedon, as soon as he was aware that Glaucos had gone back, was downcast, nevertheless he did not forget his warcraft but striking with his spear at Alcmaeon, the son of Thrista, stabbed him, then wrenched the spear out, and he following the spear fell on his face, and the armor elaborate with bronze clashed about him. And Sarpedon, grabbing in both ponderous hands the battlements, pulled, and the whole thing came away in his hands, and the rampart was stripped defenseless above. He had opened a pathway for many. Aias and two crows aimed at him together, and two crows hit him with an arrow in the shining belt that encircled his chest to hold the man-covering shield, but Zeus brushed the death spirits from his son, and would not let him be killed there beside the ship's sterns, and Aias plunging upon him stabbed at the shield, but the spearhead did not pass clean through. Still, he pounded him back in his fury so that he gave back a little space from the battlement, and yet not utterly gave way, since his heart was still hopeful of winning glory. He whirled about and called aloud to the godlike Lycians, Lycians, why do you thus let go of your furious valour? It is a hard thing for me, strong as I am, to break down the wall, single-handed, and open a path to the vessels. Come on with me then. This work is better if many do it. So he spoke, and they, awed at the reproach of their leader, put on the pressure of more weight around their lord of the councils and on the other side the Argives stiffened their battalions inside the wall, and a huge fight developed between the two sides. For neither could the powerful Lycians break in the rampart of the Danans, and so open a path through to the vessels, nor had the Danan spearmen strength to push back the Lycians from the rampart, once they had won to a place close under it, but as two men with measuring ropes in their hands fight bitterly about a boundary line at the meeting place of two cornfields, and the two of them fight in the straight place over the rights of division. So the battlements held these armies apart, and across them they hewed at each other, and at the oxhide shield strong circled guarding men's chests, and at the fluttering straps of the guard skins. Many were torn in their white flesh by the bronze without pity wherever one of the fighters turning aside laid bare his back, and many were struck with the spear carried clean through the shield. Everywhere the battlements and the bastions were awash with men's blood shed from both sides, Achaean and Trojan. But even so they could not drive panic among the Achaeans, but held evenly as the scales which a careful widow holds, taking it by the balance beam, and weighs her wool evenly at either end, working to win a pitiful wage for her children, so the battles fought by both sides were pulled fast and even until that time when Zeus gave the greater glory to Hector, Priam's son, who was first to break into the wall of the Achaeans. For he lifted his voice and called in a piercing cry to the Trojans, Rise up, Trojans, breakers of horses, and wreck the ramparts of the Argives, and let loose the inhuman fire on their vessels. So he spoke, driving them on, and they all gave ear to him and steered against the wall in a pack, and at once gripping still their edged spears caught and swarmed up the wall's projections. Meanwhile Hector snatched up a stone that stood before the gates and carried it along, it was blunt massed at the base, but the upper end was sharp, two men, the best in all the community, could not easily hoist it up from the ground to a wagon, of men such as men are now, but he alone lifted and shook it as the son of devious devising Kronos made it light for him. 
as when a shepherd easily carries the fleece of a weather, picking it up with one hand, and little is the burden waiting him, so Hector lifting the stone carried it straight for the door leaves which filled the gateway ponderously close fitted together. These were high and twofold, and double door bars on the inside overlapping each other closed it, and a single pin bolt secured them. He came and stood very close and taking a strong wide stance through at the middle, leaning into the throw, that the cast might not lack force, and smashed the hinges at either side, and the stone crashed ponderously in, and the gates groaned deep, and the door bars could not hold, but the leaves were smashed to a wreckage of splinters under the stone's impact. Then glorious Hector burst in with dark face like sudden night, but he shone with the ghastly glitter of bronze that girded his skin, and carried two spears in his hands. No one could have stood up against him, and stopped him, except the gods, when he burst in the gates, and his eyes flashed fire. Whirling, he called out across the battle to the Trojans to climb over the wall, and they obeyed his urgency. Immediately some swarmed over the wall, while others swept in through the wrought gateways, and the Danans scattered in terror among their hollow ships, and clamour incessant rose up.